presented by Historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. Uh, anyhow, we are getting closer to a couple big festivals in the church here. Uh, first is October, uh, Reformation at the end of October. Uh, we'll be celebrating our uh, annual October Fest, bringing that back after a couple of years hiatus. Uh, if you would like to help out with that, please contact Mona Casper or Nancy Olson, and they will be able to uh, tell you where they can use some help with setting up for the service, or setting up for the meal, uh, doing meal prep, decorations, things like that. Uh, I don't think that you'll say no to any volunteers, right? Okay. All right. So, uh, with that. Uh, then following the week after, we'll have our observance of All Saints Day, uh, where we'll have a commemoration of the faithful departed, everyone who's died in the last year of faith. Um, if you have a name that you would like to be read during the commemoration, please let me know. we will be sure to include that uh, in our bulletin, and we'll be able to give thanks to God for all the good that they did for all the saints who are uh, at rest with him now. Um, I think that's it for our announcements, and so with that, uh, just make a note that once we get to the service of the sacrament, uh, we'll be uh, opening up our hymnals, so just turn to the page as indicated in the bulletin. Please rise for our opening. <laughs> In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malam and Kili. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malin and Kilian died, so that, the, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. 
So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He will command his angels concerning you. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless the soul of me. The epistle is from 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Cousins rebelled. 
So tensions rose through the centuries. Finally, when the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim, and the Samaritans retaliated by scattering human bones all over the temple in Jerusalem to defile it, things had reached a breaking point. There would be no more interaction between them anymore. Any communication, if it happened, was hostile. Things had reached such a bad state that the Jews in Jerusalem had carved in stone over the temple, nothing foreign shall enter. And this referred to the Samaritans, those distant relatives of the Jews, now considered foreigners, outsiders, traitors, even worse than Gentiles. So when you hear this morning about a Samaritan in the borderlands between Galilee and Samaria having leprosy, you can be sure that many saw his affliction as justice. He was receiving what was only fair for one of his people, the traitors, and so he was cast out which was what they would think was all too fitting for someone belonging to the race that had tried to usurp the Israelites' inheritance, who sold them out to Gentile emperors. Of course, this Samaritan had taken up, taken up residence with some Jews who also had leprosy, nine in fact, but certainly the same judgments wouldn't have been heaped against them. That's just how confirmation bias works, isn't it? You only see the things that you think are already you already think are right. You only see the things that prove your point. Those other nine that had leprosy, they were probably okay. They just had some bad luck. But that one Samaritan who caught it, he deserved it. But there was still hope for him. Jesus was passing through. There had been reports everywhere in the region about how he had healed and saved others, unclean people, even Gentiles. So as Jesus passed by on the road, the Samaritan lepers stood with the other nine and cried out with them in hope from a distance, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And that is when Jesus did something truly amazing. First of all, he called a shock, like Babe Ruth, but on a much grander life and death stakes kind of scale. He sent them to the priests to show the priests that they had been cleansed. Now keep in mind, the lepers had not been cleansed when he told them to go. It hadn't happened yet, but Jesus knew exactly what he would do and exactly how it would happen, so he sent them. He called a shock. They're supposed to go to the priests, the ones trained to identify leprosy as per God's instructions about their job in Leviticus. And so they went. Now this shows another amazing thing, that his word had created very strong faith in them. Simply the promise. Jesus created faith in the hearts of these ten, who went without hesitation at his promise that they would be healed. They weren't healed right when the promise was spoken, but they trusted that it would be fulfilled by the time they got to the priest. And so sure enough, as they went, they were healed. And now we have to back up to see the full picture of just how amazing this is. Because there's much more than a physical healing happening. There's also a spiritual healing through that faith created by Jesus' promise. Remember everything that leprosy would have meant for those Jewish lepers. Because they were unclean with that disease, they would have been barred from the temple. Their leprosy made them unclean, and nothing unclean was permitted in the temple precincts. So no matter how badly they wanted to go, no matter how much they needed the benefits of the sacrifices offered there, they didn't have access. They couldn't get into that place where God said he would make, make his name to dwell, where he would be present for the good of his people. 
But now, with this healing, they would be led back in. They were healed physically, but they were also restored spiritually. They were sent back into the community of their fellow Israelites, having access to their God at the temple once again. And there's one more miracle in all of this. Notice that Jesus doesn't only tell the Jewish lepers to go and show themselves to the priests. He also sends that Samaritan. Jesus wants the Samaritan declared clean as well. Remember that, instru that inscription in stone over the temple? Nothing foreign shall enter. But now Jesus, the Lord who had been present in that temple throughout the ages, who was now present in the temple of his flesh and blood body, he now tells the Samaritan that he is to be declared, declared clean enough to enter the holy places, to enter and present himself before God's altar. Jesus, with his word, with his promise, is bringing the Samaritan into God's people. Jesus is welcoming that outsider, even the one that most people would have considered the worst, beyond redemption, too distasteful or evil to ever be counted as one of the Lord's saints. But that's what Jesus does. He opens the eyes of those on the outside, and he shows them the truth. He turns the Samaritan away from his misunderstandings, and he sends him to where the true God is living among his people. We heard about God doing that for Ruth in the Old Testament reading today. He brought her, a Moabite, and he made her one of the Lord's people. In fact, he even wove her into the family tree of the Messiah to come, making this foreigner an ancestor of Jesus. Jesus brought in the self-proclaimed chief of sinners, St. Paul, who persecuted the church and made him an apostle, giving him God's own words to speak to the church for millennia to come. And he does the same with us. We, who have been on the outside, who come from every sort of background imaginable, with our own sins and shames and sicknesses haunting our past, we have been brought into his temple here. He has brought us in, cleansed and purified us from the leprosy of sin. He has woven us together as his people, united in one body with his own body and blood in the sacrament. He's ushered us all into the temple of the church through baptism, keeping us safe, showing us where to run for protection. He's done this here in this congregation, uniting us. He's done this in the wider church, with believers throughout the world from every nation and language under heaven. He even unites us with the church at rest, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, bringing the heavenly temple down to us every time he's present in the Lord's Supper. He heals us, body and soul. He brings us into his presence. He gives us access to himself, and he surrounds us with others who have been healed, just like us. There are times that you will feel like you're on the outside, alone, ashamed, unclean. And this could be because of something that you've had happen to you, or it could be because of something that you yourself have done. It could even just be because of something that seems like it's a part of you now. You feel like you have something sticking to you, to your conscience, your heart, your soul, your mind. You may even feel looked down upon, like a modern day Samaritan. But Jesus has claimed you. 
He is not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed. He doesn't see you as an outsider. He's called you to his temple, not of stone, but of body and blood, of water and word. He calls you to the temple that the Samaritan recognized, the temple of Jesus himself, the greater fulfillment of all that that temple in Jerusalem was pointing forward to. So come to this temple of body and blood here at the rail. Be cleansed of whatever it is that's sticking to you. Believe in his promises. Even if you have to wait until you're on the way to see them fulfilled. And then, after giving thanks to him for his love and mercy, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your Jesus has saved you. In the name of Jesus, who makes his church one. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.